Good afternoon. My name is Alex Schneider, uh, and I am pleased to welcome you to this already third joint seminar with Eurofins and Wood Electronic. Today's topic is wireless power transfer and uh, key testing. Uh, today's speakers are uh, Glenn Konings. Uh, he's a test coordinator uh, from Eurofins. Um, he will take care of the second part of this presentation and send Sam Som, he is the vision manager for wireless power transfer at Wood Electronic, and he will uh, kick off this session. Um, as I said, my name is Alex Snyder. I'm a field application engineer uh, working in the Netherlands and sometimes also in Belgium. Um, and I uh, will start to uh, hope to answer well to uh, pronounce all the, the questions you might have. A strong word, but no matter there. So uh, how is today going to look? Um, like all our seminars, you are muted. Uh, that means that you cannot speak, but you can write to us. We have a Q&A session available uh, at the bottom right side of your screen. Depending on your language settings, it might call it a little bit differently, but in English, it's a Q&A uh, or a V&A in, uh, in Dutch. Um, and you can write down all your questions there. After the seminar, uh, we start asking them to the presenters and hopefully they can uh, provide us with an uh, with a satisfactory answer. If not, because we run out of time or whatever the reason, uh, of course, we come back to you later uh, via email or phone call uh, to answer the question uh, that you uh, have uh, asked us. Um, if you run into any problems, uh, just give a shout out via the chat or give us a call. Um, as you could heard, we are going to record this session. That means that you can uh, yeah, watch it back later on our uh, YouTube channel. And of course, you also will be able to share it with any colleague uh, that was not able to attend today, but might find this also interesting. Uh, total time is about one hour, plus minus a few minutes, maybe. Uh, we're going to integrate and in, in live demo, so that's always tricky time-wise. So please forgive us if we a bit overdue with a few minutes. And then, of course, at the end, we have the Q&A session. So uh, just to give you... Uh, an indication of what we're going to talk about. Um, uh, Samsung for Wood Electronic is doing a small introduction to wireless power, uh, the difference between inductive and resonance coupling, and we'll talk a lot about applications uh, and we'll also give a live demo. Uh, and uh, Glenn Konings will talk more about the G, uh, uh, the standard, the testing uh, about it, the specification, how to test, and what kind of troubles you might run into if you are going to test uh, your application uh, to apply for uh, a G certification. So that's what we're going to do today, and that will end my role. Uh, Sam, I will pass on presentation to you. It's done now. So I will want to wish everyone a good presentation, and Sam, good luck. Thank you, Alex, for these uh, welcome words and um, appreciate this to be part of this uh, webinars. And um, yes, I will try to start directly with uh, the presentation. So let's try to share my content. Okay. Um, yes. I hope this works, Alex, also. Um, it works. In the presenter mode. Oh, no, this is not correct, and we have to just change slideshow. And then go here. Yes, now it works. Good. So welcome to the wireless power transfer enabled IIoT session. We cut the cord. As Alex mentioned, my name is Jem Som. I'm responsible for the division of wireless power transfer at ISOS globally. Normally, if we're talking about wireless power transfer, everybody is thinking about what is possible and uh, which the, the, which parts, which electronic devices we would like to um, power. But first of all, I would like to show you a strong, let's say, family. Uh, this is, let's say, our Ruth group, and I think most of the people knows this. So our um, privately owned Professor Ruth here on the left-hand side in the picture, we have... Um, around about uh, 80,000 employees and more than 400 countries in 80 country, uh, 400 companies in 80 countries. We as a Worth Electronic Group are, let's say, more or less 10th of this total Worth Group and three business units. And we, Alex and uh, the other Worth Electronic guys from the passive components, we located at the ISOS Group. So very shortly, 
And um, maybe a, a first picture out of this is you can see this is a drone from a, a company nearby Munich where I am located is, is called Quantum Systems. They provided me with this kind of drone. Later on, I would like to show you why, but just give you an idea. Everything here is wireless, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, everything is directly sent over the data. Only the battery, which you can find here in the in the, in the nose of this uh, drone, is um, charged with some wires. First of all, I would like to give you a short introduction how wireless power works. So in principle, I think from physics, um, you can remember this is a transformer. If you have a transformer, you have a core around here in black. And if we cut them, like maybe with a chainsaw in this case, because it's so big, we have a primary side and a secondary side. The primary side at wireless power transfer is transmitter and the secondary side is our receiver. These are separated with a big air gap. So this is, let's say, more or less wireless power transfer. We transferring energy, not with a ferrite, we are transferring energy over this big air gap. If we place receiver and transmitter quite near to each other, the concentrated magnetic field will transfer the energy to the secondary side. They are mostly used um, two ways to transfer this in the market. First of all is inductive coupled. Inductive coupled in my explanation, at the transmitter side, I have a coil and the receiver side, I have also a coil. These coils are closely coupled to each other and the magnetic field are concentrated between each other. And you can see in red lines, the B field, which blows through both coils and will magnetizing this coil. And then you can catch up this energy here. For sure, as you can see here, we have a kind of stray field, but I will, explain this uh, later on as we have a ferrite plate here as well the magnetic field is concentrated the other point is we can do it also in the resonant way it means resonant is and both are resonant but loosely coupled yeah it's maybe a better explanation and this system is working in a higher megahertz system so this inductive coupled systems are working between I said, 85 and 200 kilohertz. Um, if we look into the SAE, like for e-cars, e they are at 85. Um, if you have, a, let's say, a mobile, like what I have here in my hand, um, then you can uh, be sure it's in the range of 150 kilohertz. The loosely coupled system is working, for example, at 6.78 megahertz, like for the Air Fuel Alliance. And then I'm talking about antennas. In my let's say explanation if i'm talking from antennas we have an impedance matching an rx a receiver antenna or two and we have a very very um loosely coupled system which is connected maybe with this where uh, uh, here shadow which i included here is but we have much more freedom in the x y and z direction but in the other way around a higher stray field and a bigger um, field outside and not concentrated between these coils. In our uh, next foils and our next, uh, for the rest of the session, we are always talking about inductive coupled, closed coupled systems. So what I would like to show today, first of all, different kind of applications, which you can use industrial internet of things up to 200, 400, or much more watts. As a basic for our industrial internet of things, we have our 200 watt up to 200 watt kit, some added values. I would like to show you the LCD board, which gives you an enabling part for IIoT. And this IIoT, I would like to present as Alex said in a live demonstration. Hopefully it still runs on my desk right now. So <laughs> let's cross the fingers. And a proof of concept, as I mentioned, the drone. And for sure, in the end, our support. But important is, from my side, how to include or implement the wireless power technology 
in your application as easy as possible. Okay, what kind of applications do we have right now in the market or could be possible? So for sure, uh, lawnmowers, drones, as I mentioned, or some kind of power tools, maybe also my laptop. Uh, there are some from Dell and from HP they're working on. Um, also some agricultural robots, which can drive around and um, measure with their sensors, humidity, temperature, and so on. Additionally, you can have um, in the inner cities, charge uh, your scooters or bikes, or maybe kind of caddy cars or wheelchairs, forklifts. So from very low power means in this case, maybe a lawnmower about in the range of 50, 100 watts, 150 watts up to several kilowatts. I did this in my, yeah, it's a one year home office. Yeah, maybe in the free time, everybody did a different kind of things in their own projects. Um, so one of them was I get in touch with the company Quantum Systems and they borrowed me this drone. This drone, uh, it's quite big. So the size here is two and a half meter and you can completely um, deselect them and then put it in a huge case. And here is the battery and there is the possibility to put some kind of cameras or other measurement instruments. So in Zoom, this looks like in this case here is possible to do a payload. So what, how this looks like? In, you can see at home here, we have the drone, which I built up and um, I built this up at home and to try uh, to show and to implement wireless power transfer. So our wireless power kit include in the payload side, and this is the transmitter to transfer the energy. If it is included in the drone and the drone will land at a specific spot, this is very easy to program. It's possible to charge wirelessly. In the payload, you can see I placed the PCB and also my uh, fer uh, the ferrite, so the coil, and here we have um, the battery management. So in a little bit zoom way, you can see I cut out here and placed the, the, uh, the coil nearby directly. It is on the outside case. On top, as mentioned, is the battery management system. Um, uh, we used here a TI chipset and then these cables can be connected here as an example to the battery directly. So you can see if you have an application which is wired charged right now, this is the case in this um, drone, it's quite easy to implement a ready to go solution. Our kit is the basic basis of this, what we're talking about. Um, here we have some uh, added value, some, uh, some very important points. So we have a sinusoidal current profile, which will have less EMI. We have a resonance frequency as this working on, and we can changing the output voltage. It can be regulated by the resonance frequency by changing the frequency. The system itself can be scaled up, up to several kilowatts as the full bridge um, just have to change, let's say, specific parameters or specific components, um, which we also help you. The zero crossover point will affect to a high efficiency. As mentioned before, uh, we can scale the voltages and currents on the outside, what is needed, and a data transfer between receiver and transmitter is guaranteed with the software, which you can download for free on our websites. The 200 watt kit or up to 200 watt, yeah, we have to say, um, is possible here to buy uh, as a, in a box. You have the transmitter receiver boards, a power supply and uh, a load, which you have to connect. Otherwise it will burn. So as I mentioned, we have the full bridge, our resonant tank with the coils and an active rectifier. Everything more uh, I would like to point out, please go on our website w-online.de or .com and then ANP 070, this is the application note which is based on this kit. 
if you would like to download the software and to because it's a development kit yeah so i appreciate this that you download the software do any changes what you want to do and then you can work on your end so first of all as mentioned you have to go to the website then we'll fill in some uh, data of you then you will get a email and then you are able to download the zip file which includes all the source codes the libraries everything is included and you can change what you want then uh, the next step you have to go to the infineon website at the infineon website you have a so-called dave software this dave software looks like here is a screenshot of our software and you can change the data transfer rates um, i don't know the regulation loop or what you want to do or toggle any leds and you need an XMC debugger, which you have to buy. This is not included in the kit um, to flash or program the XMC controller on transmitter and receiver side. As I mentioned before, e-bikes, e-scooters, they have a normally a different kind of um, power or battery voltage. For example, not 20 volts as we have on our uh, kit. Maybe they have 36 or 48 volts. This is no problem. We can help you to and just give you the bomb what kind of product you have to change that is applicable for the 48 volt application. Additionally, uh, in this zip files, you will find the GABA files, the layout files, the schematic files, um, the software itself. But if you want to have the Altium files as the layout and you want to implement it in your system or on your board, for sure, on request, we can provide this. Additionally, if we now look um, not only on e-bikes, uh, maybe on higher power applications, we have a new coil, which is a little bit bigger. So the mentioned coils before have a square shape size of 50 millimeters. This is a 70 millimeter round shape with the same inductance. So that means no resonant tank changes must be done. You just have to plug and play. But then by changing also some parts on the bomb, you can transfer up to 400 watts with this coil. Coming to the next, we would like to enable industrial IoT because this is what the topic of today. First of all, we need a LCD board. This LCD board is an end-to-end -end IoT implementation. It is an add-on board. It will not run by themselves, and you need for sure a sensor. A bi-directional data transfer is implemented in this new software. So we need the kit, as I mentioned before. In this kit, we have a receiver board, a transmitter board, the coils. This is just placed in this picture to show the coil. For sure, normally you have to flip the coil, otherwise it will not work. And we have a sensor and a board. In this case, we have a, our own temperature sensor board here and we connect it by I2C to our receiver board. And we have our LCD board. We have a new website for that and you just click on it and then you will find all information what you need. Some uh, summary here is um, this board and this display board, we used a lot of own passive components, capacitors, EMI, ferrite beads, LEDs, and so on. And addition, for sure, we use again the same XMC controller from Infineon. It makes the life easier. So mostly components from WE. Uh, display, you can program again by yourself. You can download every needed documents documentation from our website um, the application i mentioned already and you can also go over the online catalog to order it also here if you would like to use the sensor and the lcd board with the 200 watt kit you have to update the receiver board the transmitter board that it will enable the sensor and enable the connection to the lcd board so you have to go to the website you have to click on new firmware for transmitter and receiver board and then you just download the zip file and with the xmc debugger you 
just flash the transmitter and the receiver board. If this is done, I can build up here a system which can directly, for example, measure the temperature and pressure uh, in the room right in my office here. And I can show this on a dashboard. So now I hope it will work. I will change to my here. It is hopefully it will update. So this is now the, the live measurement here. So it's not updating the website right now. So I don't know why. Maybe it's stuck, but I can just pick up my camera. Hope it this will work. You can see on my desk. Hey, Alex. So you can see here on this end here, I have the sensor, the, the temperature sensor. This is the board, the receiver board with the two coils. Then we have the transmitter board with the LCD display. And you can see here the RS232 the connection to our feather wing, which will transfer the signals by Wi-Fi to the second feather wing board it's here. And I have my mobile, which is uh, here, which is connected as a hotspot to the Wi-Fi here and will send the data to our um, dashboard, which you have uh, on the screen right now. So like always at uh, live demos, yeah, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it's not working. I don't know why it's not working right now, but if we just go back to our presentation, as you see there, the, normally the, the data will get up and down. I don't know why it's not working right now. Maybe some issues with my mobile. Yes, it's right because it's not any more, not on any more connected. Let's turn it on the hotspot. Now let's see if it's working. Maybe let's wait a second. Okay, I will just continue. If it works, I will just uh, show it again. So, I would like to try to, uh, to explain a little bit more in detail on which were the, the directly we can see where these uh, data transfers are going. So we will see here by I square C bus, the data will go through the uh, receiver board. They will be in band modulated with ASK and the back channel is FSK. If you have to regulate the loop by changing the load or by distance changing of the coils and uh, the frequency we will adapt it to all these uh, things around. The UART here on this side will directly transfer the data to the LCD board and we can have a look on it here. And the UART interface here just bypass them to the wireless node. So these wireless nodes we can use up to 65,000 if you have in a factory, for example, different kind of machines. And with the proprietary WE transfer wireless transfer protocol, data will be safely transferred to the Wi-Fi module. At the Wi-Fi module, it will be sent out just with the standard Wi-Fi protocol to the cloud. And at the cloud, we can show this data um, on our smart device or mobile devices. The feather wings, which we are using here in, is the TIO one. It's a gateway, as I mentioned, with the proprietary protocol. This is this board. And the gateway Zelvo, is a tie on again, plus a Calypso, which sends the data to the cloud. These two, we call it an IIoT enabler. 
Additionally, for the dashboard, we can help you to create this. Uh, we have some examples and web applications for Microsoft or Amazon, and we implement here this for in this case this IoT device for WPT. All step-by-step -step documentation and code examples for this dashboard you can find at GitHub for free and you can download it there. We have different kind of feather things which we have um, developed. So for sensors, different kind of sensors. We have this Tyon One as mentioned. Um, then we have the Calypso for Wi-Fi. We have a power module and uh, a microcontroller module. So all these sensors made a dump application to a smart IoT application. So you can use the microcontroller and like Lego, you just click on, on top and you can just extend or reduce the functionalities. Adafruit and SparkFun, uh, they have hundreds on boards in the market and you just can combine them as we use the same interface. Our next steps, uh, we have created a new application node to increase the data rate between the transmitter and receiver side. As maybe you remember, I mentioned 500 bits per second in band data transfer. But if we can use NFC, we can increase the data rate up to 848 kilobits per second. This is possible with our new coil, which we have a combined coil with a wireless power and NFC coil at one part. Middle of this year, so maybe in the next uh, quarter, um, we should go um, and we will um, be ready to have an NFC board, which includes this interface, which will have also the antenna impedance matching on top, and you can combine it like the LCD board with a cable, and you can transfer this data in a higher bandwidth. In the end, uh, maybe if you would like to have a little bit more information about wireless power transfer, we have a tautology. Um, please get in touch with your local sales or FAE contact um, to get a hard copy. If you need additional help, um, for sure, you can ask directly in our Q&A session, but also go on our website for wireless power or to the application node website. As mentioned, contact our local with electronic guys, or you can email to our email address for all these uh, wireless Wi-Fi, um, GPS, sensoring and topics, we have an own support. It's a WCS minus support or digital engineer email address. And uh, just in the end to give you this email address of the GitHub where you can download everything according to the dashboards and the feather wings for sure as well. Yeah, I would like to say, uh, Thank you uh, for your attention and for the opportunity. And Alex, um, I would like to hand over to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, if there are any questions, please ask them in the Q&A sessions. Uh, for now, we continue with Glenn. He just arrived. Uh, had some uh, IT issues in the background, but nothing to worry about. Everything turns out great. So welcome, Glenn. Uh, if everything is right, you will have the presentation, yes? Yep. Quickly up over. Perfect. It's visible. Uh, it's thinking about it. I see a mouse. Okay. Make it quickly. Screen. It's easier. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. So, hi everyone. I'm uh, Glenn Konings uh, from Eurofins Digital Testing Belgium. And following Sam's presentation, um, I'm going to talk about Qi testing, um, wireless power charging. And Qi is actually the brand or the logo behind uh, the wireless power consortium. But more will be explained uh, in the next few slides. Um, I would like to start off with the agenda. Um, the topics that I would like to discuss during this presentation. Uh, first of all, yeah, short introduction of myself, an introduction to Eurofinance Digital Testing Belgium, uh, the WPC, why is she logo is that important and testing, 
um, the supported power levels now. Um, when you like to submit a product for she, uh, recently the WPC released a new specification version 1.3. I'd like to talk about uh, the major updates uh, for that. Um, then we also have uh, other WPC standards. Um, quickly, I'm going to quickly introduce those. Testing itself, uh, how you can become a WPC member, how you can register a product, and then also the, the two steps in testing, compliance testing at an authorized test lab, and then interoperability testing at one of the two interoperability test centers. Um, shortly, I'll, I'll talk about some of the hurdles or pitfalls, slash pitfalls during uh, and after testing that a manufacturer can can face um, when he submits or he uh, she sorry submits a product for testing um, and then last but not least um, some additional services that we can provide uh, to manufacturers as Eurofins Digital Testing Belgium. Okay, um, who am I? So um, my name is Glenn Konings. Um, I started working at Eurofins. Um, now, a little over nine years ago, um, at the start of my career, I started as a tester. I immediately got dropped in the whole she interoperability testing. And uh, nowadays, I, I manage the, the test service. Um, I'm the primary um, contact uh, if you like to go for testing or if you have any questions related to so. Um, also, because I'm, I'm um, closely, uh, also because I'm, um, yeah, uh, each day I'm, I'm involved in sheet testing, so um, I'm closely following up with the activities within the Wireless Power Consortium. I'm currently the acting IOP team chair, local license co-chair, and I'm part of also other different working groups where yeah um, all kind of topics are discussed um, so I'm also um, yeah uh, keeping up to speed with with all new uh, technologies or, or, or um, activities going on there um, okay so that's a, a short introduction uh, about myself uh, if we then go to European digital testing Belgium um, we were the first authorized interoperability test center for she in the world. Um, that was in late 2010. Um, nowadays, there are two interoperability test centers, but more of that uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, we helped writing the, the interop test specification, how to, how for IOCs, how to perform the, the actual test. Um, we being the first, we also have a lot of experience, uh, 10 years, over 10 years now. And besides she, we also do other technologies like USB, HDMI, um, display ports, SATA, uh, wired technologies. Uh, started in Belgium and now currently we're service, servicing the interoperability testing for she in Hong Kong. Um, also more of that later um the advantages of hong kong are primarily that it's easy accessible closely located to other authorized test labs um in hong kong and, and shenzhen um, that's where most of the market is right now for wireless charging um easy shipping and you know, the guys over there speak fluent english and chinese that helps a lot um so that's it for your digital testing then uh, the wireless power consortium. So uh, the wireless power power consortium is actually the consortium behind the, the Xi logo, and the technology that yeah pretty much now has become the the standard for wireless power charging. Um, mainly because um, yeah uh, all of the smartphone manufacturers, I can say all of them, uh, maybe a few not, but all of the major ones uh, have implemented Xi. And are using C in their flagship models. Even now, we see it evolving to mid-range, um, mid-range um, models. Um, 
LWC consists of about 400 members. Um, also, yeah, it, it, it doesn't only um, get implemented into phones. You, of course, need chargers. And um, for those, yeah, also car manufacturers have, have their chargers uh, imp implemented into cars. Um, and IKEA, for example, has it implemented in their furniture. Um, so, yeah, a lot of um, manufacturers that have uh, implemented the, the G technology and are making use of that. Um, currently, we can say that over yeah, 11,000 products have received the G logo. Um, not all of them have been tested. Some of them um, are substantially similar to a tested product. Um, but yeah, it's 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 so that more than eleven thousand products carry the Shi logo, and yeah, of those products, a lot of more have been sold, of course. Um, which makes the the next bullet point: uh, more than uh, a billion fully tested and approved devices sold last year. So that's a, a huge number. Um, so uh, a huge business as well. Um, but yeah, so. That's briefly about the WPC, uh, the consortium. Um, I'd like to talk about the Xi logo and why testing is that important. Of course, there are two key points, safety and compatibility. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a picture of a, of a, a product that carries the Xi logo. So um, consumers can easily refer to that logo when they want to know, okay, is this product uh, safe to use and will it charge other uh, she compatible uh, receivers? Um, uh, in other words, it will work how it's supposed to. Um, if a product is not she certified, it may not correctly make use of the foreign object detection, which is pretty critical uh, thing uh, or must have for wireless chargers because, yeah, if not, um, if you would introduce uh, a foreign object like a um, paper clip or uh, aluminum foil uh, between a receiver and transmitter, yeah, you, you would get like the burn marks in the, in the picture below on the right. Um, not good. You, you definitely don't want that in at your home or in your office. Um, you don't want that anywhere. Um, so that's why it's that important. Um, and the WPC has uh, a specification that is built around safety, compatibility. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important that um, uh, products are tested um, against such specification and built also uh, against such specification. Um, some online platforms also now only allow C certified products to be sold. Um, the WPC is a, yeah, um, also spearheading that, that uh, move to for online shops to only offer C certified products because yeah, otherwise you will, will end up in, in unsafe products and, and yeah, lawsuits and, and yeah, you don't want that. Um, okay, so that's briefly uh, why the SHE logo and testing is that important. Um, I think it's obvious uh, why. Um, recently, the, the WPC um, released a new specification version. Um, they moved from version 1.2.4 to 1.3. Um, some major improvements to the structure uh, were um, introduced, uh, but also yeah, many additional compliance tests. Uh, many of them are based on issues that we uh, face during interoperability testing, which is uh, the last step in testing. Um, so we only receive products that pass compliance testing. So if if your product fails interoperability testing, there must be a missing compliance test. So a lot of new compliance tests came out of failures during IOP. Um, 
like he mentioned here, and uh, manufacturers can continue to test and register against the previous uh, specification version um, until 180 days after the release of the version 1.3 specifications called uh, the so-called grace period. Uh, you don't right away have to uh, fulfill all the requirements in 1.3. Um, what I would also like to talk about is an important addition, uh, which is authentication. Um, authentication between a transmitter and a receiver. Um, it will get particularly relevant if we will go to even higher power than, than currently uh, 15 watts per sheet. Um, because, yeah, uh, authentication is all about uh, a charger being able to say, okay, I'm out, uh, I'm a she charger, the receiver to to see, oh yeah, he's right. <laughs> he is a C charger. Let's go to a higher power level. Um, because if not, um, yeah, and if you would go to a higher power level um, and all the safety and compatibility requirements are not fulfilled, you will end up in, a, <laughs> in some problems. Um, so that's a major addition to um this uh, specification version also when when um, aiming for those higher power levels in the future um okay supported power levels so i also already mentioned that um it now goes up to 15 watts um you have the baseline power profile products that go up to from zero zero Point one, for example, to five watts, um, and then the extended power profile products that go from five to fifteen watts. Um, specification also provides a wide range for power transmitter designs, um, going from A one, what is it now, to A forty now. Um, also B type designs; those are multi-coil designs. Um, yeah, a lot of coil designs, so manufacturers can really um, select what design fits their implementation the most and, and submit it for testing. Um, and also, yeah, it's because the WPC now exists uh, over yeah, 12 years now. And those transmitter designs are a buildup uh, of manufacturers submitting new designs to fit their implementation. Um, okay, so um, yeah, like I said, as a manufacturer, you can submit uh, a new design, uh, transmitter design. It must then follow the, the approval scheme, um, but when approved, it will be added to the specification uh, as an annex, and then in the next major update, uh, officially added to the, the specification. Um, Part of such approval procedure is that you have to test, uh, have to pass both compliance and interoperability testing. Other WPC standards. So there are uh, currently uh, some new standards evolving. Okay, the key is, is, has been there for quite a while already, uh, but the two other ones uh, are recently um, yeah, emerged, <laughs> let's say. Um, the key Cordless Kitchen standard is a standard that enables the development of safer, smarter, and more convenient kitchen appliances. Um, yeah, many of you may already make use of, of the, the induction um, in uh, so the um, cooking with, with an, an induction furnace. Um, and this is actually quite similar, uh, but it also focuses to appliances uh, like uh, a water cooker or rice cooker um, or any other appliance uh, mixer, such like such things like that. Um, it's like I said, it's, it's a standard that is not that recent uh, um, and it delivers up to 2200 watts. Currently, um, they're about ready to release an official certification program. The specification is already there, um, but still they are about to release a certification program and then 
yeah, members can submit products uh, to be certified uh, according to E. Um, the little brother of um, LEV uh, wireless charging, uh, so light uh, electrical vehicle. It's uh, an interface, uh, what, sorry, it's a standard that defines future proof charger and receiver interfaces that support regular and fast charging uh, for light uh, electrical vehicles. Um, I think Sam uh, showed it in his presentation. Um, so, like, um, now almost everybody uh, drives an electric bike. Uh, you want to charge it, um, you can easily do so. Uh, without making any contact um, via charging stations um, that uh, work through this technology. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's a recent standard, recently emerged standard uh, within the WPC. So a lot uh, investigation still has to take place, um, and the standard needs to evolve. There's also the industrial wireless charging standards. Um, it's, it's mainly built around uh, robots, unmanned uh, robots. Uh, for example, yeah, in the, the right hand picture, you can see uh, a drone uh, delivering packages. Um, if you want to charge that drone, you can do so wirelessly. Um, so you don't have any uh, metal contacts um, that can be um, yeah, exposed to to water, uh, yeah, uh, condensation or something else. Uh, so you really have um, a more safe charging method. Um, and also, yeah, if you, if you don't have any uh, metal contacts, um, you will also uh, have a, a product that will uh, be more. Um, it will last a bit longer because you don't have any contacts other than the, the, the surface uh, where uh, it, it's the charger, of course. Um, okay, so that's about uh, the other WPC standards. Uh, then I'd like to briefly talk about product registration. Um, so if you're a member of the WPC, uh, you can become a member uh, through the WPC website and, and fill in all the documents and pay your membership fee. Um, different memberships levels apply. Um, you can submit products for testing. Um, you can do so online and then make all the arrangements with the ATL that tests compliance and then the IUC that tests interoperability. But um, the whole uh, uploading of test results and things like that is uh, done online. Um, so. If you submit a new product for testing, you will be assigned with a unique CID number, uh, and that is used throughout the registration procedure. Um, and also, when your product is registered, that CID number sticks to your product. Um, yeah, it's a bit how the process works. Um, the local license, license admin, uh, short the LLA, controls everything, the whole process. Um, and like I said, after compliance and interoperability testing, we upload the reports um, and then it's finalized and registered if everything is okay. Uh, and a member can fully yeah, follow that, uh, follow those steps uh, through the WPC member section. Um, what is required when, when you uh, submit an initial Product application, of course, yeah, you need to fill out certain product information, such as transmitter design, uh, potential power or maximum C power level in case of a receiver, uh, support of Samsung's proprietary charging extension, by the way, which is part of the, the C specification, um, a self declaration form where you need to fill out exactly that as well, but sign. Um, and then, for example, stamp for a lot of Chinese uh, manufacturers, uh, the stamp is the go to signature. Um, and yeah, of course, products of the products, uh, pictures of the product that you submit for testing. 
Um, and also in case of a power transmitter, um, pictures of the, the coil and the PCB. Um, the WPC now requires such pictures um, when to so when they would, uh, if your product is registered and sold, uh, the WPC organizes uh, market inspections um, to see if, if the products sold are still the same uh, as, as what is what was tested. Uh, and and a, a big part of that is also to check the PCB if no other components are used or a different schematic or yeah, a different coil even. Um, so that's why the WPC now also requires uh, that to be uploaded and also to check if what you declare as transmitter design, if, if that fits uh, what you upload as a picture for the coil. Um, sheet certification, so I already mentioned this uh, a few times. Um, so the compliance testing part is the first part in the, the testing process uh, and that's being done at an otherwise test step. So you can see here below there are, are quite a few, um, but you can also see that quite a few are located in China, uh, a few in the US, in Germany. Uh, but yeah, primarily um, the the labs are all uh, most of the labs are all uh, based in the APAC region. Uh, and yeah, that's. Primarily because most of the, the manufacturers submitting products for Qi testing um, manufacture in China or uh, Korea or um, Japan. So, yeah, that's a bit the, the idea behind it. Um, so it's the, the first step in the, the testing process. Um, the otherwise test lab will use the, the approved test system from Mach 9 to um, check if your product um, yeah, is compliant with the, the sheet test specification. The compliance test focuses on power delivery, sorry, communication of the physical layer and protocol wise. And yeah, now nowadays uh, for 1.3, uh, these tests will also focus on authentication. And of course, a uh, very important one, point object detection. Um, below is a snapshot of such uh, FOD compliance test where um, uh, foreign objects are introduced between a uh, test power receiver and the transmitter on the test. Um, and then the, the test power receiver builds up uh, power and yeah, requires more and more power and with the, the or an object uh, inserted in between the two. Uh, it is then tested if, if the temperature does not go over 60 degrees. If so, yeah, the, the test fails. Some products are, are built that they, if, if yeah, they, with a, they have a heat sensor and if it goes up to 60 or more, they shut down, they stop power transfer and, and they wait uh, when it cools down again to reinitiate. Or some uh, make use of, of the FOD method that um, you uh, check what is uh, being received. Uh, so, sorry, you check what is being transmitted and then received. And then if, if there's too much difference in between that, um, it's also a sign that uh, another object is, is uh, running with all the, the power, um, stealing all the power. So that's also a method of um, detecting for an object. Um, and yeah, many other tests uh, are performed uh, depending on the, the product capabilities. So it depends on what you support um, that yeah, uh, the tests are done. Things to keep in mind uh, when submitting a product for testing, and that's for testing in general, not only for compliance testing. Um, for both compliance and interoperability testing, we make use of a cross marking um, to align the, the products uh, on a test power transmitter, for example, or test power, uh, sorry, power transmitters from our test bed. Um, so 
you'll have to ensure to cross mark all five samples that you submit for testing um, with respective coral center markings. All five samples submitted also need to be identical, which uh, they can must, because uh, otherwise you'll end up in issues uh, during uh, testing for sure. Um, the required cabling and power adapter, for example, to enable the wireless charging need to be provided. Um, when a power trans transmitter is to be tested at multiple embedding depths, in the case of a subsystem, for example, you have to provide all the respective spacers, uh, so minimal and maximal embedding depth uh, to, to simulate that. And a user manual, if available, how to set up if, if, if setup is not that straightforward. Uh, and also, yeah, the information about the LED, uh, LED behavior is always useful uh, because we, we, if we would come across an issue, for example, during interoperability testing, we can note down, okay, this is the, the LED behavior. Typically, if it's blinking red, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a sign of FOD, uh, and that can then easily be communicated to the, to the customer. Um, interoperability testing. Uh, so what we do as a, as a test lab, um, as an IOC, um, as I mentioned, we're located in Hong Kong. And after a successful compliance test, we start with interoperability testing. Um, also, yeah, the interoperability test fee can be directly handled uh, with with Eurofins digital testing. Um, upon a pass result, we upload. But yeah, the, the product passed all testing, and the result is uploaded. Uh, when the result is a fail, unfortunately, uh, the issue must be resolved. And once the issue is resolved, both compliance and e interop testing need to be retested. So it's a uh, a process that needs to be repeated. Um, so it's it's yeah, it's sometimes a real uh, burden to manufacturers uh, if they're in a hurry. Um, yeah, they need to start all over. Uh, so I hope that what I would like what I'm just like to discuss now would help um, you to prevent such issues. Um, so, during interoperability testing, a product must test uh, must pass one hundred percent of the test bed. Um, so, a new power receiver such as a smartphone uh, is tested against the, the power transmitter test bed and must pass that test bed entirely, and and vice versa. So, if a new transmitter is submitted, it must pass against the the full uh, power receiver test bed. Uh, even a single issue requires a fix and a and, uh, full retest on, on both compliance and interrupt testing. The hurdles during testing, uh, is, it's mainly about testbed variation. Uh, there are a lot of uh, products in the testbed, now less than uh, in the past, because uh, the WPC uh, was a victim of its own success. Products passing interoperability testing were added to the testbed, but that was wasn't possible anymore, so they had to have a different uh, mechanism. Uh, products are not now no longer immediately added um, for transmitters. Only products that are unique of design are added, um, or products of a new specification version are added. Power receivers do still get added uh, after they are published uh, to. Uh, the public and, and sold. Um, this also because there are less receivers being submitted for testing. Um, and also we have a, have a, a restriction that uh, after two years, the, the product is removed from the testbed, so-called lifetime. Um, the testbed consists of a wide variation of devices. I, as you can see here below, I, I've copied here some pictures of, of um, typical uh, receivers and transmitters. Um, so you have all types of uh, receivers, smartphones, phone covers, earbud cases, wireless charge mouses, portable speakers. Uh, yeah, a lot of variation, and, and we now see the trend that there are 
more and more uh, earbud cases being uh, submitted for testing. It's it's actually even catching up with the smartphones uh, itself. Um, yeah, and then for power transmitter tests, but also a large variation. You, you can from consumer pads to automotive inline chargers, subsystems that can then be later on integrated in large systems like furniture. Um, another hurdle during testing is uh, the power adapter. We, it's a bit ironic, but yeah, the power adapter uh, and, and the USB cable is is key um, because uh, if um, your power adapter is not capable of supporting the required power demands or levels, it it can cause the power the the product to fail certain compliance tests or even yeah guaranteed such as the guaranteed power test or interoperability against receivers that say oh um, you support uh, for example EPP. Uh, let's go to that higher power level, but then yeah, if you have a power adapter of five volts, two amps, you'll never reach that uh, higher power level. So that's very key for products being submitted for testing, power adapter and the cable. Um, uh, so yeah, I would definitely um, encourage all manufacturers to when submitting submitting a product to submit it with the the power adapter which it will be sold with uh, the product, and if yeah you're selling your product without one, uh, to submit it with a, a capable uh, good uh, power adapter. You can also contact us if you want to learn more about good power adapters, um, and then we can fill you in on that. Um, debugging and fixing issues. Um, so uh, um, on-site debugging, uh, we do support in Hong Kong. Um, and before we did that here in Belgium, but now nowadays as the test bed is over there, uh, we do uh, support on-site debugging and then manufacturers can then test with the actual failing samples. Um, you can we can get you in contact uh, with testbed product manufacturers um, uh, so that you can test for yourself uh, at your site and not if you're far away uh, from Hong Kong, then you can still debug with those samples and um, uh, resubmit your product if you uh, got a fix available. Um, we also, when we um, Report an IOP issue. We use the She Sniffer tool. It's a it's a quite a handy tool. Uh, it's a, a USB um, power device that we bring in to the to the magnetic charging field, and then we uh, log the communication. Uh, and then you can see as a as a manufacturer where it goes wrong. Of course, yeah, if you make use of a uh, also. Uh, different uh, logging tool, we can, through, if you provide us with a procedure, we can also uh, log the issues by it. So, uh, but that's always provided to she sniffer logs uh, and typically come very much in uh, handy. So, um, yeah, also IOP, IOP issues can mainly relate to protocol, power delivery, from communication or no response to a digital thing. Uh, so that, yeah, you actually don't get any response at all. Um, submitting a request to the WPC to remove a specific testbed product is also uh, a way to get around the issue. Uh, if, if you, for example, have a issue, a single issue against the testbed and you feel that, yeah, the, the testbed transmitter is not behaving as it should, you can uh, request uh, to the WPC to remove that product. Uh, but then you have to be, have to uh, submit a, uh, a, a, a fully documented request on why you think that uh, this product is, is not functioning as it should and showing undesirable behavior. Um, 
pre-interoperability testing is also uh, something that can avoid you um, running into issues during the official stage. Um, we offer that as a service. Um, we apply the same test procedure. We can apply the same test procedure as during official, or yeah, you can ask something completely different. Uh, you can ask us to test for one minute, for example, instead of a normal five, uh, or test for other things like uh, usability or end user experience. There's also the, the power efficiency aspect that we can um, that we can check. Um, so that's yeah, that's also part. That's the my last slide. Um, so power efficiency. Um, we did that in the past for the WPC, uh, and we there we checked if we by use of of um, a certified receiver, if we could by by such um, benchmark. Uh, certain transmitters on power efficiency. Um, and we, we would then uh, have the, the power receiver on specific points over the charging interface and have it to charge from 10 to 90%. And then we would log the, the average consumption uh, of the power transmitter and, and the time that it takes to, to charge up the device from 10 to 90%. And then you can have uh, the power efficiency. Um, so that is a, a method how we can define actually uh, how efficient your device is. Um, we can compare it to already benchmarked uh, transmitters. Um, so yeah, if you're interested uh, or would like to have more information, you can always reach out to me uh, and then we can provide you with such. So yeah, um, that's about it, I guess. So yeah, if you have more information also on G certification, you can go to the WPC website, which is also a very handy website uh, where you can find all information about testing uh, and what to do, um, and also how to become a member, of course. Um, but like I said, if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me directly uh by this email address um and i'll be happy to uh answer any questions or uh also remarks that you had during this presentation can also be shared by email if you prefer um so yeah alex that was it for me uh hopefully that was <laughs> uh all, that all went smooth i think it was thank you very much thank um, you running a bit out of time, so I uh, yes, want to go to the that. questions quickly. Um, so there are a few questions coming in. Uh, first question that was asked is, why are proprietary wireless charging methods allowed to go over 50 watts and she is not? I'm not sure who can answer this one best. Maybe you can do that, Sam. Yeah, for sure I can do. Um, also, uh, Glenn already mentioned in his uh, presentation that uh, Qi is working on higher power, uh, like the kitchen or LEV or industrial applications. So, um, yeah, so it is not not allowed uh, from Qi. It is not ready the standard. So still, all the companies are working on it to release a, a standardization. And this is, let's say, always a bigger step. A lot of companies must approve this and release them. And for the proprietary solutions, which for example, our 200 watt kit, it is um, for sure here, we have a little bit easier way as it is not like a standard that will work all over the world. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it will work over the world, but for uh, maybe Glenn can also add here some points about the certifications. You have to do it for each country, for each regulation groups, different kind of continents, different kind of countries have different kind of um, regulations in their country, and all these are, um, let's say, taking account in the standardization of Qi. If we do a proprietary solution, we do it just in a for one application, for one appliance, for one customer, for example, and this is much, much easier. And our, for example, the 200 watt kit is just an easy step into this technology. Thank you very much. Hope that answered the question. Just to add from my side, uh, the, the the power level is basically yeah, as much as you want to or dare to, maybe. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, the, 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 the only limitations, of course, is how much power you could effectively uh, transfer uh, over over calls uh, and that kind of statement. But right. yeah, perfect. And so that brings us to the other question, uh, and this goes all the way down because the question here is uh, how about power modes below one watt, for instance? Because we tend to talk mm -hmm. about higher power and even more power, but of course, a lot of applications are very low power, like for. Yeah, no, I will just answer this, Glenn. Uh, maybe you can add on if you want. Um, so lower power is also possible because the G is up to 5 or 15 Watt. That means it's also for 1 Watt possible. So does that not mean that's not possible? But if you have this low Watts uh, to transfer, um, here in this case, then also um, the Lucy coupled system from Airfuel Alliance could work quite good because here you have the antenna matching and in the high field, um, it's not so much power will be transferred and it will be not so dangerous uh, from the point of view for EMI. And also you can use for sure the new NFC um, standard, which allows uh, with the NFC antenna at 13.56 megahertz power transfer up to one watt. So as you can see, for lower, let's say milliwatts up to one watt, there are more possibilities than uh, the induction coupled, closed coupled systems. They give uh, more spatial freedom for your appliance or application. Okay. Great. Glenn, do you want to add something to that? No, I completely concur with uh, Sam. So yeah, typically Perfect. for she devices, we see that they go up, yeah, that they start off from from one watt, uh, for example, earbud cases uh, start off from one watt uh, and, and go up to five or fifteen. Uh, but yeah, it is possible. Uh, that's that's surely that surely is. Yeah. Okay, great. Glenn, then I have a question from you. Uh, this was asked by uh, me. Uh, on your slides, you talked about that it was taking a photo of all the applications that are uh, being certified, just to make sure that nothing changes when they are in the field. Um, mm -hmm. My question refers to uh, if at the current market situation, there's a lot of shortages of components. Uh, if a manufacturer should swap out an, an existing uh, call from the current supplier to, let's say, a root electronic uh, version, which are both uh, A5 uh, calls that are designed for transmission. Would that be okay, or do, does that mean that they still have to recertify it? Um, in that case, they can always consult with the WPC if they can uh, register that product as a substantial similar product. Um, if it meets certain requirements, it can be the case. Uh, so. In any doubt, they can always contact me or uh, the WPC directly to see if they if recertification is needed, uh, just to avoid yeah running into issues during a, a market inspection. Okay, I was hoping for a clear no. It's not needed, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so well, it's <laughs> typically market inspection is there to uh, get all the the unsafe products uh, that really cheat. Uh, and, and are unsafe from the market. Um, if if it's if it's still compliant and interoperable, uh, then yeah, uh, the WPC won't take uh, legal steps or something like that. Um, but it's more yeah to to just check if if what is in the field is is still uh, safe to use for for end consumers. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much for your answer. Well, that brings us to the end as well. The, we are run out of time. Um, uh, again, if you still have any questions that you want to ask but couldn't today for whatever reason, just contact one of us. Uh, that uh, We are always happy to help you with all your questions. Uh, from my side, thank you very much for attending. Uh, to both of the speakers, thank you very much for, for presenting. Very interesting topic. Uh, and well, perhaps see you uh, in the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.